Hi there, and welcome to our webinar, The Most Innovative Things We Saw at HIMSS 18. I'm Kellery Lohman. I'm the Vice President of Marketing at SiriusMD, and our team, including Dr. Blake McKinney, the co-founder of SiriusMD, and my lovely co-host today, attended HIMSS 18 March 5th through the 9th, and we wanted to share some of the great things we saw at this conference. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. I wanted to let you all know that you can use your WebEx chat feature on the top right of the program to send us a note or a question. And also, your lines are muted. If you have any trouble along the way, please just send an email to get started at CirrusMD. Hi, Blake. How are you doing? Great, Killer. <laughs> Good. Can you give us a little bit of background about SiriusMD? We're not going to do too much of a commercial here, but I just wanted to uh, give folks a little um, preview of who we are. Sure, uh, Kelly, and thanks. So everyone knows SiriusMD is a virtual care platform designed for enterprise healthcare. We were founded in 2012 around the notion that when a doctor's friends or family have a medical question or something wrong, most of the time, rather than use the phone or video or email or go over to the house, they're using text. And so with that notion, we searched the market and most of what we found in the telemedicine realm were visits, whether they were happening by phone or video. We knew people could email their doctors sometimes, but we moved into enterprise solutions for health plans. And in 2016, became the chat solution for Kaiser Permanente, first in Colorado and uh, uh, just most recently in uh, Washington State. Uh, we now have four of the top eight payers live, some small contracts, uh, some large. And um, what we've discovered is that the market wants more than just the ability to chat with a the doctor. Um, they want the whole care team involved, from scheduling to insurance questions to access to the health system and where to park. Chat is the way people want to communicate. Excellent. Thanks for that little background. And I'll just give a little background on the solution. Uh, we are a chat-based platform, HIPAA compliant, and we have a scalable um, enterprise level uh, virtual care platform. And we're happy to go through that um, with you at any time. But today we're just going to talk about um, what we learned at HIMSS, and, and I think next we're going to talk about our clients. So can you just give a quick brief overview of that, and then we'll get to the HIMSS stuff? Yeah, so we found that um, initially uh, payers were most interested in um, providing solutions for people without, <coughs> excuse me, requiring them to come in, and um, that later migrated into the integrated delivery network space, and most recently, um, we've partnered with Texas Health Resources, which um, is a health system in North Texas, uh, Greater Dallas-Fort Worth. Um, they're interested in providing a navigation center hosted by physicians, a front door uh, to the health system, if you will. Excellent. Well, let's move on to what we learned at HIMSS, why everyone's here joining us today. Um, in our email marketing that we sent out, we had a little bit of a provocative message, I would suppose. Traditional telemedicine is dead. Um, and what do we mean by that, Blake? And, and what did we learn at HIMSS? Just kind of looking around, we went to every single session. We went to the main stage. We went to breakout sessions. We went to everybody's um, booths that were there. And we really dug into what, what kind of problems they were solving and what kind of utilization rates um, what, what they were seeing in traditional telemedicine. And, and we came away not feeling super great about kind of some of the traditional things that are out there. And I just wanted you to kind of talk about some of these things that are on these little bubbles here. And then after that, um, we'll play a little video of uh, one of the speakers from actually Kaiser that was speaking at him. So um, if you want to start here, that would be great. Sure, Kelly. Well, I think the squawk in the industry is that we are – in, in the game of telemedicine, probably in the second inning, maybe the beginning of the third. Mm -hmm. um, if, if I had to talk about version one telemedicine, it started 20 plus years ago um, when a patient may find themselves inside a clinic of some kind connected terminal to terminal to a consultant in another mm -hmm. facility far away, maybe a university. Version two of telemedicine uh, was more direct to consumer initially. Um, the concept 
that you could go online, pay a fee, and be connected to a physician to help you with a question, um, telephone or video. It was a one-time visit uh, that uh, at first was paid for by consumers, and then uh, health plans and employers started paying for those. There are uh, some large uh, telemedicine companies, national companies, that have had success in that, and I think have brought uh, some improvement uh, to accessing health care, um, you know, probably better than going to urgent care mm-hmm. in many cases. Mm-hmm. So video visits, we found at Hims this year, are starting to fall out of vogue. Mm-hmm. I, think I learned, yeah, sorry to interrupt you, but I learned um, just by asking about utilization rates, most are in single, single digits. Um, and I think you'll talk about what the payers and health systems are looking for for more utilization and kind of expanding that. But I wanted you to talk about about that. Like well, that's right. Um, the the people who have paid for um, the telemedicine uh, visit to be something available for the patient um, were hoping for a little more. They were hoping people would use it, that it would take. Um, but still, I think there were too many barriers in place. I know for me personally, getting on a video is a barrier. I don't want to, especially when I'm sick. Mm-hmm. Um, not only am I a, a, a physician, but you know, every now and then I'm a patient. And mm-hmm. so, um, but doctors too, don't love the concept of video. I think putting a credit card number in, I think going through a questionnaire, um, perhaps talking to a medical assistant ahead of that visit, those are all barriers that are um, frustrating um, and, and any kind of wait time at all for an online experience mm-hmm. is uh, it is really prohibitive. Um, but what people want when they when somebody says to themselves, I'm sick, they're looking for not just access, but they're looking for resolution. Mm-hmm. And they want it to happen quickly and they want it to be high quality. So the real trick in moving on to version three of whatever telemedicine is going to be mm-hmm. next is in finding what's that non frustrating approach that puts solutions Mm-hmm. in front of people rather than just access to something. And that's really interesting. And one of the at one of the talks at HEMS, I, for, I forgot who said it, but someone was talking about the Israeli model, about, you know, putting the best providers out front in a triage situation instead of having them, like, way behind many layers and having fast resolution and, and moving people through um, as quickly as possible. Can mm-hmm. you talk about that a little bit further? Yeah, well, in... in um... In Israel, they've they've dealt with mass casualty incidents um, uh, quite a bit, and um, in in experimenting with different models, discovered that when resources are scarce, the most intelligent thing you can do is put your expert out front, rather than letting patients self-select for which pathway they think they think is appropriate, or having your lower trained professional be the one that decides whether a patient goes to point A, point B, or point C. Um, in Israel, they took their most experienced trauma surgeons out of the operating room and put them in front of the hospital to triage ambulance traffic, foot traffic into the hospital in these mass casualty settings. And by doing so, created a more streamlined and efficient experience for everyone, mm-hmm. including the care team that sits behind that intelligent first point of triage. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting, just kind of taking those points from what we've learned in the brick and mortar real life scenarios and bringing that kind of um, type of solution into virtual care. And I think um, that is really interesting. And one thing, um, Dr. Melmed, I have a little tiny clip on the next slide, but what he talked about was exactly that, putting some of the best people out front and um, and using using them to staff their virtual platform. So I just wanted to play that clip and see how we can explore. The other element is the ability to bring the chat to a resolution. Um, We considered using mid-level providers and nurses. The problem here is that folks come in and they want an answer and they want a resolution. And protocols don't always get you there. Our nurse advice um, calls run 35, 40 minutes and 40% of them end up with an appointment anyway. So if you put a provider who can make a decision and make a disposition and take care of the problem the first time, it ends up costing you less in the long run. So I think that's really revolutionary for virtual care when you're talking about maybe this is the telemedicine 3.0 version where we're at or somewhere in between two and three. 
Um, that's a really different way of thinking, and, and I, I thank you for that example. Let's um, let's move on. There was a lot of buzz at Hims, right? It's the largest healthcare conference that that I know about, um, and there was so much going on. But let's just kind of focus on what's in our lane with virtual care, and maybe we can shake things up a little bit and talk about one of the most hot topics hmm. at Hims, which was blockchain. Now, I personally went to um, the main stage sessions and a bunch of breakouts and tried to learn as much as I, I could about blockchain. And there were, you know, people out the door sitting in every seat, really trying to learn and absorb what's going on with this. So I just wanted to bring that to the attention because I do believe this in some way will relate back to virtual care. Um, it's all about giving patients access, access to care, access to their records, you know, being more participatory. And I just thought that was an interesting thing. You all um, that are listening today can go to the HIMSS website and, and download some of the presentations that they, that they shared there about blockchain, but it, it is really interesting stuff. The second thing I wanted to talk about, which had a lot of buzz, were chatbots, bots, bots, bots everywhere, artificial intelligence, also known as AI. Um, we we really learned a lot about some of the future state of AI, and I know we're not quite there yet, but I wanted you to kind of explain like what we're using AI and chatbots for now, what it's good for, and um, and you know maybe some of the things in the future that we can see with bots. Yeah, um, so I think I think the industry is looking for for answers to the access problem. The access problem, as we all know, um, is uh, you know somewhat to do with the the shortage of physicians in this country and that's a scarce resource and so there's a wait time there's a backlog and so people are looking for solutions uh, to decompress clinics um, to free up doctors time um, some of the more intelligent um, you know AI uh, features I saw were all about trying to harvest natural language um, to create decision support tools for doctors that are um, you know not treating the patient per se, but helping doctors to be smarter, more intelligent. Um, you know, I think when it comes to the care of the patient, um, the AI isn't quite I enough <laughs> at this point in time mm -hmm. to actually manage the whole care mm -hmm. of the patient. I'm a massive uh, Star Trek fan. And, um, you know, the sci-fi sci world has created whole graphic doctors, you know, robotic doctors, um, the concept that you can put a human into a, uh, a container that diagnoses and treats all ailments that resuscitates trauma, that is fantastic, and I, I, I hope I live to see it. <laughs> um, when we look at the next two to five years and the technology that we all carry in our hands, um, what I didn't see on the floor at HEMS was an algorithm capable of empathy of humor, of an appropriate level of cynicism, mm -hmm. and, and most of all, judgment. Um, those are things that uh, you can't program mm -hmm. yet, yeah. I'll say. Yeah, machine learning will get smarter and smarter over time, and they'll get better and better. But it's neat to see the early stages of it, and it mm -hmm. was quite the, quite the rage at, at him. Yeah. Here, and so. we're involved in a lot of the study of the natural language that's taken place between doctors mm -hmm. and patients. And we're learning from that. Yeah. And we actually have a lot of data. This is not a commercial for us, but we do have a lot of data that can feed feed that in the future because mm -hmm. of all of the um, the encounters we've had on our platform. So that's actually a good point. Um, speaking of, so we went from kind of a technology that's pulling it all together to one that's trying to help, um, you know, with symptom checkers and some of these some of these kind of desk interactions, as we call it, to something that's really real, providing real care. And so the other most um, innovative thing we saw at HIMSS was about chat, which lands right in our lap, which is great. And this is about giving patients that instant access to care, as well as, um, you know, removing those barriers that we talked about earlier. This instant access doesn't happen tomorrow, you know, appointments tomorrow or next week or next year, they happen now. So I just wanted you to kind of give people the takeaways of sort of what we saw. There was a um, several main stage presentations, breakouts, and panels about chat for care. Yeah, and chat's out there. I think chat's a word um, that is here to stay in healthcare. 
Um, we see it in the rest of the consumer facing industry. Uh, my bank lets me chat. When I check into a hotel, they say, text us if you'd like fresh towels. The, the industry is, is giving people access to services at their fingertips and chat is a mechanism for communication. I think that, you know, when text messaging came on the mainstream, you know, within the last 10 years, really, a um, little bit before, it's how we all are naturally migrating. And so I think chat's important. Uh, what is yet to be determined is what kind of chat mm -hmm. is healthcare going to give to patients? Is it going to be chat to set up an appointment? Um, is it going to be chat with a uh, an algorithm of some kind? Is it going to be chat with somebody who can actually help you with the solution to your problems? Mm -hmm. We don't know yet. Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly know from our point of view what we do is chat to have resolution yeah. encounters. But yeah, yeah, I think yeah. we've seen a really high resolution rate uh, on our platform, and I think this type of access is uh, is here to stay. Mm -hmm. Speaking of patient access, you just brought me to my next point. So um, one of the things I wanted to chat about today was patient access in 2018, the year we are in now, and beyond. So just give me your perspective and some of the learnings that we, we found um, at PIMS and some of your perspective mixed in here. Yeah, well, I think that um, what, what we've seen, um, you know, I can just testify personally, our, our utilization rates that have finally started to, to break through that invisible ceiling in telemedicine. We see video visits um, occurring in the single digits, um, you know, with chat solutions um, given to people in a meaningful way uh, with, the, with the appropriate clinical table setting, uh, if you will. Uh, that's an environment where doctors are on duty, um, you know, dedicated to respond to people. You see um, highly efficient and meaningful interactions occurring. Um, there is a quality and a service reliability that comes when a health plan or a health system allows that type of access and, and, and gives it to people in an, in an instant and ongoing way. Absolutely. Um, I think one of the things we should really touch on too is using those modalities that consumers actually use. Um, we touched on it earlier, right? We, we barely like to video visit when we look good and feel good rather than when we don't. And so, um, you know, just touch on a little bit about the modality of, of chat with the phone. And I know, like, we're talking about and beyond right now. That is the modality we use the most. And I bet a lot of people on this webcast today have sent a text while they were listening to us. But um, that's just where we're at now. And, and beyond, we still have to meet that patient where they're, where they're at. So. Yeah, well, I think people are busy. And I know in my life, um, if I've got to make a phone call about something, I dread setting that time aside. I have to make myself uninterruptible for the length of that phone call, particularly when it's something to do with healthcare. Mm -hmm. Whether it's getting an appointment or dealing with my bill, the fact that I have to become completely uninterruptible for that time is a is a real uh, trouble point in my in my daily life during the work week. When the conversation can take place in an asynchronous way, people are able to do more than one thing at a time. Whether it's whether you're in a meeting or a teacher is sitting at the head of a class while the students are taking an exam, mm -hmm. or you're in the middle of trying to set that appointment up and the dog runs through wet and muddy. <laughs> um, when you allow an asynchronous conversation to occur, you're, you're meeting people where they are on the device that they live on. And, uh, and I think we're bringing that uh, to healthcare. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for those examples. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. We are doing these um, basically mini webcasts, a mini series. We're trying to keep them to around 20 minutes or so to respect your time, to make sure that we're succinct and tight on our messaging. So, so stay tuned for some more um, webcasts from CureSMD. Um, please use your chat button in the upper right corner to send us some questions. If we don't get back to you, um, please send us your email. We can also be reached at getstarted@curesmd.com. And um, we mentioned some of the videos that, that related to some of the most innovative things that we've seen at HEMS, and those are available in full play at, on our YouTube channel. So Blake, um, with that said, we have only a couple minutes to keep to our promise of around 20 minutes. We have a couple questions that have come in. So do you mind if we take a couple sure. questions? 
Okay, it looks like I have a couple here about chatbots. The first one is, do chatbots help or hurt the patient access? Any sense of resolution rates for bots? Yeah, I mean, you know, so there are several um, options on the market right now for people to come in and 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 get some resolution to their to their symptoms to their problem. Uh, these wind up making the most sense in a couple of very common and very um, self-diagnosed use cases. The the urinary tract infection, the bladder infection, um, is really the the clinical use case that the the house of telemedicine was built upon. The person who's able to self-identify answer a few questions, and the evidence supports a short course of antibiotics for somebody who, who's able to, to reasonably fit into um, a certain clinical criteria, tie a little bow up on top of uh, their case, and, and get that antibiotic prescription. And so that's the, satis that's the satisfier um, in the self-diagnosed um, chat algorithm case is the person who gets the antibiotic that they mm -hmm. knew they needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes complete sense for mm -hmm. sure. Let, um, I'm going to do another question really quick. This might not apply to you since you are an ER doc, but it says, Blake, as a doctor, do you have any worries that bots will replace your practice? So maybe not for you, but maybe if somebody's uh, listening that's a PCP or somebody, it might, might be a little bit more troubling, but uh, can you handle that question? Yeah, Kelly, I'd love for, um, and thanks for that question, <laughs> um, I'd love for technology to create an overcrowded physician workforce. You know, most doctors would love to work themselves out of a job. Um, that's, that's, I don't think we're in any danger of that happening. Um, again, you know, the particular province of the physician is to confer peace of mind. The ability to reassure is beyond the simple antibiotic prescription when you need it. It's a relatively low hanging fruit use case. Um, humans come in with human problems and they're complex and um, you really need human communication, um, clinical judgment, humor, relatability, uh, you know, in order to, to really help people yeah. with their problems. So your answer is no, you're not worried right now. Not right now. <laughs> but not you right want to play well with bots when, when they are around you. <laughs> I, want the, I want the machine to, to remain um, the physician's tool, something to help, okay. uh, not something to get in the way. Cool. Quickly, in the next uh, 30 seconds, let's try to address this one. We have a telemedicine solution that was only video and phone based. Could a chatbot or what you're talking about here with care chat, could these run alongside of our investment or does it have to replace it? Uh, okay, good question. I don't think that uh, you, know, you have to throw your, uh, your solution that you invested heavily in in the, in the garbage bin uh, just yet. A lot of these solutions were designed to help people with mobility problems to help physicians who need to practice uh, remotely or uh, per perhaps on a geographically dispersed population. Um, a lot of the tools out there now allow visits to happen and, and uh, there's a lot of good new uh, uh, legislation around reimbursements. Uh, and, and a lot of that software was reverse engineered off of those regulations. And so I think that, uh, that telemedicine version two is, is uh, something that can meaningfully be integrated into mainstream medicine. Um, you know, insofar as, as uptake may ever, uh, uh, you know, may, may ever take hold. I think that an instant consumer pleasing experience is something that's also needed um, as an entry point uh, for care for many people who, who need answers right away and fundamentally don't want to go to the ER, but are often left with no other uh, great choice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Great questions. I see a few more coming in on um, WebEx chat, so thank you. Um, we will address those via, via email, or if you give us your phone number, um, we'll be happy to call you back. Um, so that's all the time we have for today. We appreciate you so much for joining us and giving your valuable time to uh, listening to the most innovative things we thought since 2018, and we look forward to seeing you on another webcast. Have a good day. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.